thanks so much for that introduction. I want to thank you all for being here. For me, it's great to be here in the ICGV. I came here when I was starting my PhD, so it's magic for me to be back here now that I am starting my lab at UNC in Chapel Hill. And as Tito said, um, I started studying splicing during my postdoc, uh, so my PhD was in trafficking. So now I'm trying to combine my PhD in trafficking with my postdoc in splicing that are the two main interests in my scientific career. So after the, everybody can hear me well, yeah? Uh, so after sequencing the genomes of different species, one of the most important observations that was uh, made was that the, there was no correlation bet between the complexity of the organism and the number of genes encoding for proteins. So that suggests that there should be some type of gene diversification mechanism during evolution, and one of these mechanisms is alternative splicing. And alternative splicing is not like an exception, it's more a rule. If we think that more than 90% of the human genes undergo alternative splicing. And the other thing that is interesting is that the heart and the skeletal muscle together with the brain are the tissues where the most tissue specific and conserved alternative splicing takes place. I don't know if I have to introduce this here, but alternative splicing is a post-transcriptional mechanism that explains how one gene can give rise to more than one transcript due to the inclusion or exclusion of alternative regions. And this can be, and this is regulated by mainly by RNA binding proteins, but there are also uh, reports telling that splicing can be also regulated by uh, chromatin marks, um, chromosome positioning, DNA methylation, the speed of the polymerase too. And this process that I, I was showing you just for one gene in the nature occurs in multiple genes at the same time. So we can think that there are different protein isoforms expressed, for example, in different tissues, but also during in health conditions or in disease uh, conditions or, for example, during different stages of development. And this will be translated in different physiological functions, basically due to different stability of the proteins or different domains in the proteins or different stability at the RNA level. So the main interest, the, main, the two main questions that I have and my scientific interest are in two angles. One is how splicing is regulated and coordinated during development and diseases where these networks are affected. And the other question I have is, we know that there are many developmental transitions that occur at the splicing level, well, which are the functional consequences of these networks? In general, the splicing field is very focused in the regulation of splicing and not so focused in the functional consequences. So today I want to tell you a little of what I did during my postdoc uh, in Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. Uh, two stories that this one was published at the end of last year and this one is uh, published like two years ago. But I will focus on, on this one. And some unpublished data that we are generating in the lab in, at UNC and then I will focus a little bit more in the research program in my lab. So during embryogenesis, the heart is the first organ that forms and functions, and the embryonic period was very well studied at all the levels, at the physiological level, but also at the transcriptional and post-transcriptional level, but that's a little different for the postnatal uh, period for her development. And this period is very interesting because there are many changes happening during, between birth and adulthood. One of these changes is that the heart has to adapt to the birth condition, adapting the oxygen levels. The other big difference is that while the neonatal and the fetal heart will use carbohydrate as the 
energy source, the adult herd will use fatty acids as the energy of source. And also there are many changes in the cardiomyocyte structure, the internal structure of the cardiomyocytes that are the main cell types in the herd. And at the molecular level, there are many, many of these physiological changes are driven by transcriptional and post-transcriptional changes that occur between birth and adulthood. And what is interesting is that when the herd fails, there are many aspects that revert to fetal stages in terms of the physiology of the herd, but also in terms of the gene expression networks and all the um, yeah, gene expression programs. So the main project during my postdoc was to try to characterize the transcriptional dynamics of herd development in specific cell types in the closest possible model to the herd BD. So what I did was to isolate cardiomyocyte and cardiac fibroblasts that are the two main cell types of the herd at different postnatal stages and also the ventricles at different postnatal stages. And then I performed high throughput studies using deep RNA sequencing techniques, and from here I obtain information about gene expression, alternative splicing, alternative promoters, and alternative 3' UTRs. And today I will focus just in one discovery regarding alternative splicing changes in specific cell types and during development. So that's the study that I told you that was published in 2014, but one of the main uh, findings was that there is a reciprocal regulation between the cardiomyocyte and the, and the fibroblast in terms of gene expressions. So genes that are upregulated in the cardiomyocytes were downregulated in the fibroblast and vice versa, and those genes were functionally related. But the finding that was very interesting to me was in terms of splicing. I found that the trafficking and membrane dynamic genes are regulated by alternative splicing specifically in cardiomyocytes, and that happens between postnatal day one and postnatal day 28. So it seems to be circumscribed to a time window, and it seems to be cell type specific. And one thing that is interesting is that after birth, the cardiomyocytes are in, at, the, at the birth moment, you have cells that are small and without all the specific architecture of the cardiac cells, and these cells stop dividing around postnatal day five, and they start growing, and they need to develop these estriation patterns that, are, that will form the T-tubule structure that, are, that is important for the excitation-contraction coupling, and this T-tubule formation is basically imagination of the plasma membrane, and you should think that there are many like ion channels and receptors that need to be localized into this tissue structure. So I was thinking, well, maybe the cardiomyocytes utilize alternative splicing re regulation for this maturation process. But nothing is known about which is the function of splicing of trafficking genes in cardiac context or muscle context. So before continuing, let me tell you how we study splicing in the bench. Basically, in, we design primers that will flank the, that will bind to the flanking introns, flanking exons of the alternative exon, and we design RT-PCR uh, assays, and we will amplify both type of transcripts, the longer trans transcripts and the shorter transcripts, and then you can um, separate these products based on the size by polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, and you can quantify this by densitometry. So you can have numbers to these splicing changes, and we do that all the time. So at Till this point, I told you that alternative splicing of trafficking genes is a developmentally regulated. It seems to be cell type specific for the cardiomyocytes. It's conserved in human herds and is reverted in sick herds. So all this suggests that this uh, role, they can have physiological roles that are evolutionary concerned. But the question is which could be this physiological roles. 
So in order to ask this type of question about the physiological functions of this splicing network, we want to modulate or we want to be able to modulate endogenous splicing events or a group of them together in a controlled manner and I want to do that in, within an in vivo system. So I came with two approaches. One is to try to block these normal transitions that happen during development and ask the question, well, if we block these splicing transitions, what happened with the development of this specific cells or this specific tissue? And the other approach is to wait till the transitions are complete and then induce the reversion. And we are working with these two approaches. So the other approach that I mentioned is let's wait till these transitions are complete and then induce the reversion. So now the question is a little different. Is instead of asking which is the contribution of splicing to the development, let's say, of the functional herd, now the question is which is the contribution of splicing to maintain the proper function of an adult cell or an adult tissue, yes? So in order to use this approach, what I have to tell you is that at least at this point it's not easy to modulate splicing in vivo in heart. The techniques that are available are not efficient to modulate splicing in the heart. So I use to my advantage one thing that I observed after that nature communication paper that I told you. So I decided to play with four trafficking genes. One is TMEC2, is a protein that is involved in secretion and not much is known about this protein. Another one is TRIP10 or CYP4 and it's known that it's being involved in the formation of endosomes and the formation of the plasma membrane. The third one is SNAP23, I told you, a protein involved in secretion and then the clustering heavy chain, the main driver of endocytosis. Nothing is known about the splicing of these proteins. And except for CLTC, nothing is known about the role of these proteins in muscle context. So I decided to modulate the splicing of these four genes in a particular muscle that is located in the footpath of the mice. And this muscle is the flexor digitorum brevis, or FDBs. What is nice of this muscle is that we can access to that muscle in an easy way. You can inject things, electroporate things there, and it's a small muscle, so everything is highly efficient. So what we did was to use antisense oligonucleotides or morpholinos, but instead of knocking down a gene, these morpholinos are designed in a way that will bind to the splice site, right? So now if you have a morpholino bound here, the splicing machinery will not recognize those sections, and those sections will never be included. They will always be skipped. So we will have now adult mice that instead of express, they will not express the adult isoforms, they will express the fetal isoforms when we inject these morpholinos. And I decided to inject these four morpholinos at the same time, so to modulate the four events at the same time and then ask two simple questions, which is the impact on muscle physiology and which is the impact on the intracellular architecture of the myofibers. The first thing that we observe is that when we isolate the muscles from this uh, foot, the, the FDBs from these mice after three, three weeks after the injection of the morpholinos, we observe that uh, the, the, the muscles after the, the morpholino injection, they can generate less force than the control muscles. And when we measure the calcium release, we also observe a reduction in the calcium release after modulation of these four trafficking events. So this is more at the physiological level. In terms of the intracellular organization of these myofibers, one observation I made is that use, using h and &E staining, when you measure the area of the fibers, I started seeing that there are 
less fibers with small areas and more fibers with big areas. So for some reason, this fiber seems to be bigger, or we have more fibers that are bigger. And I observe the same results when I quantify the fiber area by H and E staining. So these are cross-sectional areas. Or when we isolate the fibers and we measure the fiber area of the whole fiber. So it seems that a disruption of these four trafficking uh, event, the splicing of these four trafficking event, increases fiber size. And in terms of the T-tubule structure, so this is a dye that can stain T-tubules. You can see that in control cells you have this perfect striation and you can quantify this by measuring the peaks and measuring the regularity. And this perfect regu regularity is lost after the injection of the morpholinos. And this is just a quantification of a way to quantify regularity of these T-tubules. And of course, if the T-tubules are disrupted, what I was thinking is that everything that should be localized in the T-tubules that are important for excitation contraction capping can be disrupted. And this is the case for the rhinoline receptor 1 and the HPR, that is another ion channel. These two molecules need to be in close proximity within the T-tubules, and they control excitation contraction coupling. And in control, in control muscles, you see this perfect co-localization between the two signals, and this is lost at different degrees uh, after the injection of the morpholinos. So in conclusion to this part, I told you that alternative splicing of four trafficking events, two involving secretion, one in the membrane deformation for the formation of the endosomes, and the other one for the plasma-mediated endocytosis, seems to be contributing to the maintenance of the T-tubule structure. And of course, when this splicing is affected, we have the T-tubule disruption and also the mislocalization of molecules that needs to be localized properly in the T-tubules and the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And that mislocalization can explain what we observe in terms of the reduction of the force generation and the calcium misregulation. But there are many things that there, there are question marks here. So till this part, I told you that the splicing of trafficking genes is a striated muscle specific and is translated into the expression of different protein isoforms. I didn't show you this, but we did Western blots to show that it's not only at the RNA level. We see the different isoforms at the protein level, and that's good to know. I show you that splicing of four trafficking genes controls muscle structure and function, but I we didn't discover yet which are the mechanisms connecting mis-splicing with the phenotypes that we observe, right? I show you what we see. We saw this, we saw that, we saw the other thing, but I didn't show you which are the mechanisms. And these are the, the type of questions I want to address in my lab, in my independent lab. And the other thing that I think that you are thinking is, OK, you modulate four events. Which is the guy that is doing this? Or it are, you need two, you need three, or just one? And that's another question we want to address, especially with these four trafficking events, which is the contribution of each of them. And of course, we have many other trafficking genes and membrane remodeling genes that we know that are regulated by splicing. And the other question is, is, is there any like master regulator of the trafficking genes in terms of splicing, or like a couple of regulators or mechanisms that can control the splicing of these genes in developmental context. So these are the three types of questions we are interested in on, on the lab, on my lab now. And so in the lab, we have, I, I want to set up two main angles. And one is how splicing is regulated during development. I will focus on, the, on trafficking and membrane remodeling genes in muscle context, striated muscle context. And one thing that I want to explore is, is, is if there is any type of contribution of chromatin structure to the splicing coordination of these uh, trafficking genes. And the other one is the functional angle that is more similar to what I showed you until this point. 
So in terms of the functional consequences angle, these are some of the trafficking genes that we are studying, and this is for your question. So I told you about the clustering heavy chains, NAP23, TIM2, and 310, but then there are other like adapter proteins that are also involved in endocytosis, and these type of genes are also regulated by splicing the clustering like chain A, that is another protein involved in endocytosis. Then there is another protein involved in degradation in the lysosomes, and another protein we are working now intensively is FXR1, is a membrane, is a protein that is in the same family than the FMRP1, that is the, the, the gene that is mutated in the, X, in the Down syndrome in brain. And this is the parallel, the member of the family that is expressed in the heart and in the skeletal muscle and is highly regulated by alternative splicing. And this gene controls the localization of RNAs and translation. So we are working on, on this gene in the lab now. And the idea is to use three uh, different experimental systems, one in cell culture to address more molecular mechanisms, and the CRISPR mice idea that I mentioned you before to have the physiological significance of our discoveries. And the situation in the middle is this uh, ability to modulate the splicing in vivo, but you can do many more experiments than developing like CRISPR mice for all the trafficking genes. I mean, I can't do that because of time, because of money, because of people in the lab, right? Uh, so this uh, FDV system and modulation of splicing there is a good like intermediate uh, approach to ask the question of the contribution of the splicing of trafficking genes to muscle biology. So I will show you some data we generated in cell differentiation. There is a good uh, system to mimic muscle development and uh, is the use of these situ citrol cells. These cells are myoblasts that when you reduce the serum concentration, they differentiate into, myobla into myotubes that are uh, basically, they are formed by the fusion of these myoblasts. And so you have these myotubes with multiple nuclei. And in, so this is about the functional angle in the lab. And in terms of the regulation, it's a more mid-term and long-term uh, goal. But my idea or what I want to study is that we know that during, for example, heart development, but the, true is so, the, the same is true in skeletal muscle development, there are many splicing transitions happening during postnatal development. And many of these transitions are reverted in diseases. I show you some data about that. And it's also true that there are many changes in chromatin remodeling during normal development and also in diseases. And there are many groups correlating these chromatin changes with the gene expression changes. But there are no correlation yet with splicing. And we have all the data because I have my own RNA seq data during development in mice. And the ENCODE project give you all the chip seq data uh, during heart development in mice as well. So one thing I want to do is to try to see if there are correlations between epigenetics, SMART, and splicing transitions during development. It's in, a, in an in vivo contest. And then after having this high throughput view, try to study specific uh, correlations to try to prove them, like the cause effect uh, connection in a cell culture system. And I am thinking to use maybe the c 2 c 2 cells since the splicing transition seems to happen. So these are the two angles in the lab. We are a new lab, so it's not we are just setting up our team, the people, the, the projects in the lab. So these are the type of things we want to do. And this is the people that is helping in the lab. Mainly Eric is the main person in the lab. He's the lab, the lab manager, and he's dealing with all the mice, with the main experiment, helping with many undergrads. Um, then Tom Cooper was my postdoctoral mentor in Baylor College of Medicine, where I did many of the experiments I show you. George and Jim were the people who helped me with the fourth generation measurements and the calcium release measurements. And Amrita was the person who helped me 
to handle some of these CRISPR mice when I started generating them in Baylor, and now Eric is handling everything like at UNC. And yeah, the funding sources, and thanks for your attention, and I will take questions if you have.